And so let's turn back uh, to 1 Peter uh, chapter 3 as we come to look at it now. In 1981, on a summer's evening in County Antrim, a little girl went missing. And 30 years later, the paedophile Robert Black was convicted and sentenced uh, to life imprisonment for the abduction and murder of that little girl, Jennifer Cardy. For Jennifer's parents, Andy and Pat Cardy, the previous 30 years had been truly awful. But outside the court that afternoon in 2011, they spoke powerfully and movingly about the strength of God's peace which had sustained them over the past three decades. And we want to think this evening, we, none of us may face that sort of trial and that sort of hostility or that sort of pressure. But we are called to live for God in difficult times. We're called to stand up for Christ in a world that at times, in various ways, is quite hostile to Christ's values and to Christ's ways. And will not do well in the, the massive moments, like the sort of moment that Pat uh, and Andy Hardy faced, or Cardi faced, if we're not training ourselves in the smaller moments. And Peter is writing to a people who are called to live for Christ in a world that is becoming increasingly hostile. Um, persecution under Nero is beginning to simmer and bubble, and it will boil over in a few short years with Peter himself being executed by Nero and with Christians being taken into the Colosseum Christians under pressure to declare certain things to be right and to declare that Caesar was Lord, to shift their allegiance from Jesus being Lord to the emperor, to say the things that would make them popular in their society. There were shame pressures that they were facing. They had moved away from the gods and the goddesses of the Greeks and the Romans, the old family deities. And there were shame pressures. What are you doing? This is not what our family believes. Who do you think you are going against our tribe, our culture? You have brought reproach in our family. The sort of things they have been hearing. There may have been threats against them. There may have been vicious slanders spread about them. And Peter is equipping these Christians how the, for how they should live in a world that isn't just neutral towards Christianity, but, or that just tolerates Christianity, but is growing increasingly hostile to it, that despises it, that finds the values of Christianity distasteful. They leave a bad taste in the mouth. And Peter's overall gist of what he's been saying is, look, something startling has happened to you. You have been given a new birth into a living hope. A great destiny lies ahead of you. A great beacon has been lit. Now let that beacon that has been lit in glory radiate its heat and life into your life here in time so that people can see that something has happened to you and so that you are kept fresh by the light and the warmth of the great hope that is yours through Jesus Christ. The hope that we have, the life that is ours, radically changes us. And Peter, Peter writing after his own three decades of transformation, from the feisty, fiery, contentious, confrontational fisherman who was marked by his pride, and marked by his boastfulness, is marked now by gentleness, by humility, and calling people to live in a very countercultural way. So how does he call these people to live? He calls them to cultivate three things. And we'll try and cover all three of them this evening. Uh, first of all, he calls 
Then one does to cultivate love. Cultivate love. Cultivate love in anticipation of God's blessing. Cultivate love in anticipation of God's blessing. We find ourselves in all sorts of circumstances. We find ourselves going into all sorts of circumstances. Sometimes anticipating how we'll be responded to. And how we think people will respond to us can shape how we go into those circumstances. And we can go in almost with our fists clenched or go in on the defensive. Um, We can go in maybe with uh, a resentment or an anger. Uh, Or we can go in with a fear of what people might say. We can go in um, wondering are they going to insult us? Are we going to uh, be ridiculed? Uh, We can find ourselves facing all sorts of circumstances. And how is the Christian to, to live? And how are we to respond to each other? And you see what Peter says in verse 8. He says we're to be a blessing to each other. Finally, all of you. He's, he's addressed God's people generally. And then he's spoken to, um, to citizens. He's spoken to uh, servants. He's spoken to wives. He's spoken to husbands. And he's called them to live submissively, graciously and beautifully. And then he draws it all together here. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do you see what he's saying? Be a blessing to each other. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. This is what's to characterize you. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate or tender hearted and be humble. Those five characteristics will not take time to unpack them in any great detail, but harmony. We're to be like-minded. We're not to be at each other's throats. We're not to be sort of like two rams locking horns with each other. Maybe you've seen that, two Christians falling out over something trivial. And Satan has lobbed a hand grenade in between them. And instead of them uniting with each other and agreeing to lift the hand grenade and throw it away or throw it back, they let it explode and they, they, they fall out with each other. We're called to harmony, to, to come at things from the same direction. Not mindless agreement. That's what we're called to do, is to, to have a like mind, coming at things from the perspective of God's word, letting it shape how we see things. Looking at things, not through our own personal glasses, but through the lens and the perspective of God's word. Saying to each other, not look at things the way I see them, but let's both look at things the way God sees them. We're to have a a sympathy, Peter says, be sympathetic. And that's not just sharing in each other's sorrows, which sympathy often means, but the Greek is wider than that. Having like feelings, sharing in each other's joys, sharing in each other's burdens, sharing in each other's pressures, as well as sorrows. We're to love each other like family do. We're to to see how we can be a blessing to each other. We're to be tender-hearted. In a a cold-hearted world, where the slogan, the current slogan is, be kind. We shouldn't need to be told that as Christians. That should be our, our modus operandi, our way of living. Being compassionate, being tender-hearted, and being humble, Peter says. And we live in a world where, Peter want to, or where people want to contend for my rights, my rights. Peter says, oh, be humble, be humble, be a blessing to each other. And what he says in verse 9 and, and following it, is kind of the flip side of the coin of cultivating love. It's the, I suppose we could categorize this as refuse to get sucked in. We're to be a blessing to each other. We're to show what God has shown to us. We're to treat people the way God has treated us. And we're to refuse to get sucked into the the backbiting, the um, flinging of poisoned words at each other, insult uh, and evil. But we're to respond, not just neutrally, 
The Christian is to go a step further from not just repaying evil with evil, but Peter says, but with blessing. But with blessing. He quotes then from Psalm 34, and he says that we are to keep our tongues from evil and our lips from deceitful speech. He calls us to guard our words, uh, to seek peace, to seek uh, not a, a falling out type scenario, but uh, we're to seek the shalom, the peace of people. We're, we're not just to be happy that um, a, a quarrel, well, we've walked away from it, but we're to seek resolutions where we can. We're to seek to be a blessing to people. And this, we're to refuse to get sucked in to turmoil and to conflict. And he says, he puts this very strongly, look, at verse 9, for to this you were called. To this you were called. We are called by God in response to ill treatment to respond with blessing. We're to pattern ourselves on Christ in chapter 2 and verse 22. Peter has reminded us that Christ has suffered, leaving us an example. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. And if we are Christians, Christ-like people, we should be like our Saviour, refusing to return evil for evil, but seeking to bring blessing. Let me quote to you from Jennifer Cardy's parents again. Um, her father Andy Cardy said, we are Christians. This is outside the courthouse after the verdict had been given on the man who took the life of their daughter. We are Christians and we have a faith. For the last 30 years and indeed throughout the trial, we have had a promise from God that he would never forsake us or leave us. That is in the scriptures. And he has given us a peace. It also tells us in the epistles that he gives a peace that passes all understanding. We as a family have found that peace and we have been able to live without bitterness and without vengeance in our lives. There's a man determined not to repay an outstanding evil with any bitterness or evil on his part. And then they said this, we prayed there just before we left the courtroom and we prayed for Robert Black, that Robert Black would someday know Jesus as his saviour. Just as Jennifer knew Jesus as her saviour. And the wonderful thing is that someday we will be united with Jennifer in glory. And that's just wonderful. And Robert Black can have that even at this late stage in his life. Now is that not simply magnificent. There's a Christian man refusing to get sucked in, refusing to return evil for evil, but doing what God called him to do. And the third thing to note here, and this is maybe partly, partly why we read of such a response from such a Christian, because God has great blessing in store for his people. God has great blessing in store for his people. We are, to, we are to cultivate love. We're to be a blessing to each other and to those around us, refusing to get sucked in to responding to vitriol and viciousness. With anything like that from us, we are to seek to be a blessing to those around us because God has great blessing in store for us. Do you see what Peter writes? Verse 9, Do not repay evil with evil, or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called. That's the challenge for us. But then he says, so that you may inherit a blessing. So that you may inherit a blessing. For, and he quotes Psalm 34, whoever would love life and see good days. Whoever would enjoy life and know God's blessing on his life is to live this way. God sees it. God delights in it. It's been one of the themes of Peter's letter. 
He encouraged slaves to live graciously and to live submissively, even under harsh treatment. He says, for this is commendable before God. He says, God sees it. God sees it. And he he urged wives to live such lives of beautiful godliness and grace that their husbands would see it and be really struck by the change that Jesus had brought to their lives. But he says not just that the husbands would see it, but that their Father in heaven would see it. And it was precious and it was valuable in his sight. And so as we seek to live in this world around us that seems to be increasingly at odds with each other, where people seem to be increasingly making things black and white and seeking to um, entrench themselves in their own views and not seek to reach out a hand of friendship or, or a mind of how can I understand the other person. Christians are to be marked by cultivating a, a gentleness, a graciousness, a humility, a tender heartedness to each other and to everyone, seeking to be a blessing, knowing that Almighty God has a blessing in store for them. You see, we don't need to get our blessing from other people. We don't need to get our our value from other people. We don't need to get our status from other people. God has given us all of that. We don't need to get our award from other people. And this This frees us from bitterness. This frees us from the rot of rage. God will deal with them and God will honour his people. And this is what we are called to keep believing and to keep keep holding on to. We are to respond, and this will enable us to respond with love to, to anyone and everyone around us. So we're to cultivate love in the light of God's well done. In the light of eternity, where God says, well done, good and faithful servant, you displayed faithfulness and love. You displayed my characteristics under great pressure and provocation. Well done. Come and enjoy your master's reward. Cultivate love. Cultivate love in the light of of God's promised blessing. And then secondly, cultivate. I'm going to use the word that the passage uses, but we'll have to define it. Cultivate fear of God in order to be free from the fear of man. Cultivate fear of God in order to be free from the fear of man. Or let's put it this way, cultivate awe of God. Cultivate awe of God in order to be not in awe of man or in fear of man. It seems as if Peter's readers have become a little bit gun shy. They've been hurt once. And you see uh, what Peter says. It's as if in verse 13, he's anticipating them backing off being eager to do good. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? And he reminds him, keep being eager to do good. And yes, it is easy. Don't you know that yourself? You know, you repay. uh, Somebody has done something to you and you seek to be kind in return and it's thrown back in your face. Or you've done something for someone, you've gone the extra mile and nothing comes of it. It seems a complete waste of time. And Peter says, don't give up doing that. Don't give up being eager to do good. Who's going to harm you? Here's the general principle. Get on with doing good. Get on with living these beautiful, grace-filled, godly lives. Whether it's as citizens, whether it's as employees, whether it's as wives, whether it's as husbands, we're called to live these lives that honour Christ. Um, no matter what comes. And he says, by and large, who's going to harm you for seeking to live in this way? But, he acknowledges in verse 14, sometimes suffering does come. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. 
sometimes suffering comes. Now, a couple of things to note, just on the way past here. Suffering is not the opposite of blessing. Suffering is not the opposite of blessing. Some Christians would make it seem that way. And if you're suffering, they believe that you've somehow disappointed God or not. You don't have enough faith. I think that is a despicable teaching. It is a blasphemy on God's word and on God's character. Peter here says, even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Here is something that God has permitted to come into our lives. It's not because God is angry with us. And if you look down to verse 17, you'll see, he says, For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. This is part of God's will, that suffering has come into a believer's life. Uh, so suffering is not the opposite of blessing. It doesn't mean that God is somehow displeased with his people if suffering comes your way. But the opposite of that is also true. Suffering is not proof of blessing. Sometimes you meet Christians who, who, who believe that. They're a little angular. They're a little in your face uh, with their faith. In fact, sometimes they're downright obnoxious. And people react against them. And, and, and people um, are angry at them. And these Christians then go away and say, well, I'm being persecuted for being a Christian. Well, in actual fact, they're being persecuted for being obnoxious. Um, and so their suffering isn't proof of God's pleasure. Their suffering is brought on themselves by their own attitude and their own character. So we need to be careful how we read suffering. But Peter is concerned with how we respond under pressure, that we don't become gun-shy. We don't become um, withdrawing into ourselves and saying, well, I, I'm going to be living in fear of what other people think. I'm going to retreat and I'm not going to, uh, to respond with grace and kindness anymore. In a world where hostility exists, what is to be the attitude of the Christian? Well, it's clearly not to be fight, and it's not to be flight, and it's not to be fear. What is it? And the Bible recognises the, the reality of peer pressure. It calls it the fear of man. It knows that we want to be liked, or we want to be left alone, or we want to be hugged and not hit. Um, and it's... It, it can be there in all sorts of ways. I came across an article recently um, about a, uh, it was an interview with a man who was a Christian in, um, in the banking world. And he was asked the question, do your colleagues know that you're a Christian? And here's his response. Are you joking? Of course not. It would make things very difficult. If my boss thought I was relying on prayer to get me through the day, he'd look down on me. It would make me seem irrational. So I tell him I'm going to physio when I'm going to church. It'd be very easy to look down our nose on that individual for what he's just said, but I think if we're honest, we, we've all felt that pressure to tone down our faith, to cover it over a bit. And Peter is conscious that that's the very thing that our world doesn't need. Our neighbours don't need it, our friends don't need it, our society doesn't need it. Jesus calls us to be salt and light. And the salt is no use if it loses its saltiness, and the light is no use if it turns down the dimmer switch. And so Peter encourages us here. He quotes from Isaiah chapter 8, where God says to the people who were very much conscious of all that was going on in the world around them and, and they're wondering, should we make an alliance with the king of Damascus and the king of Syria or maybe with the Egyptians? Should we rely on them because these ones or those ones could come against us and attack us? And God says through Isaiah, do not fear what they fear. Do not fear what they fear. Don't fear the intimidation that they're fearing. Don't fear the threats that they're fearing. And God's answer in Isaiah 8 
and verse 13 is this. And in a sense, this little phrase that Peter has here almost acts like a link on a web page that he expects his readers to either call to mind or for us to click and follow through and read the rest of Isaiah 8, which is what we did. Because the very next verse, Isaiah says this, The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. And he will be a sanctuary. Wow. We're not to fear what they fear. We're not to be controlled by the fear of man or the fear of circumstances. We are to give God his rightful place. And as we give God his rightful place, what happens? Like it said earlier in Psalm 34, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Or the way Isaiah puts it, and he will be a sanctuary, a safe place. We give God his proper respect and awe. And what do we find? We find him, in a sense, placing himself over us so that he is our sanctuary. That we are inside the four walls of his house, safe and secure. The angel of the Lord encamping around us. One writer says, fear of another sort takes possession of our hearts and minds. A fear that does not flee in terror, but draws near in awe and worship. And that's what Peter says. If you want to live successfully, in his case in century one, or in our case in century 21, cultivate awe of God. In a sense, read your Bible more than you watch the news. See God more than you see Facebook. And Peter uh, echoes the, what is said in Isaiah 8.13 in verse 15. He says, set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts. See who he really is. Put him in the first place. Give him the rightful place. And what will happen? People will see that you are marked by hope. People will see that you're different. And people will want to know, why on earth in a world that's like this, are you so full of hope? And how has it happened? Well, it's setting Christ apart as Lord in our hearts. That's not just saying, okay, I'm going to obey you, Jesus. That's saying, I have grasped that this God, my Saviour, is in charge of everything. Look at how the chapter ends at the end of uh, chapter 3 and uh, verse 22. Our Jesus has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels and authorities and powers in submission to him. Now, Peter says, you grasp that. You see that. You remind yourself of it. You fix your gaze on it. Set apart. Now, that requires positive action. We're going to have to give ourselves to reminding ourselves of this. We watch the news. We listen to people around us. And there's, well, I suppose, as Isaiah put it, conspiracy and rumour and all sorts of things being said. And what are we to believe? And, and what's going on? And what's going to happen? And all sorts of viewpoints. Peter says, remember that Jesus is in charge. Set that apart in your heart as the governing truth. And as you do that, that will change how you live. And as we do that, three things happen. Three things happen, and we'll finish with these this evening. This awe, this awe, this fear of the Lord produces freedom. It produces freedom. A freedom from the pressure of others, a freedom from fearing what, what others think because God is now big in our mind's eye. His reward is big. His encouragement is big. The hope that he gives is big. The new life that he gives is big. The security that he gives is big. You know, and as we read this letter, that's what Peter has been doing. And whenever 
Peter calls us to fear the Lord and to be in awe of God. As you read through his letter, that's the fruit of somebody living in awe of God. And he's praising God for this new birth into a living hope. And we've got a, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. And it's kept in heaven for us. And we are being shielded. All of that has come out of living in awe of God. Do you see? That's, and that frees Peter. That's going to free Peter to say, I would rather be crucified than to deny my Jesus. See, and don't crucify me the right way up the way. This is what history and tradition tell us, that Peter didn't want or refuse to be crucified the right way up, but asked to be crucified upside down. Because he didn't want to be the same as his saviour. He wanted and sent that reserve for Christ. Um, but Peter was willing to go to the cross to be crucified. He had lost all fear of man. This is Peter who was afraid of the little servant girl. And he's no longer afraid. He's been set free from it because he has stood in awe of God. It reminds me of William Tyndale who was asked, Why do you have no fear? And he said, I fear him not who can cast me into a fire here, but I fear him who can cast me into the fires of hell forever. See the freedom that it brings us. And so let's determine that we will stand in awe of the King of Kings so that we will be free from the pressures and the fears of human beings, wanting their approval, wanting their well done, wanting their acceptance. The way that we live for Christ in this world in a way that doesn't leave us toadying up to people and flattering them so that we get their approval is to be aware of the approval and the, the delight of our mighty God in heaven. So this awe produces freedom. Uh, secondly, Peter tells us that this awe produces opportunities to talk about your hope. Do you see what he says here? But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. This is the theme running through the book, hope. And we are to live as people with hope. And Peter prepares, one writer says, Peter prepares them for hostility, not simply to endure it, but to find in that pressure cooker situation opportunities for witness. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Live in awe of who your God is. Set Christ apart as on the throne and in charge. See that in your daily life. And you will live differently. You will live radically differently. Let me quote again from the Cardies. This time from Pat Cardy, outside the courtroom. Robert Black has done this awful deed. But I join with my lovely husband and say that he will not destroy us. I say this, murder and death and trial and trauma are no match for the grace of God. Now who, hearing that on television, could not wonder what is it that those people have that after three decades of living with this evil cloud that they have still got such grace and forgiveness and compassion. Eternity will reveal what that witness outside that courtroom has done. And so it will be with us as we seek to live, to stand in awe of our God and all that he has done, is doing and will do for us. We will find that we have opportunities to give an answer. And when those opportunities come, sometimes we, we miss them and sometimes we, we foul them up. But let's try to take them. As somebody says, you're different. I've been watching you. Why is it you always have a smile? Why aren't you down? Why do you have such hope? I saw how that person treated you. I was watching. You didn't know I saw it, but I was watching. And I saw your gentle, gracious response. I would have knocked them over. 
but you did what what is it and we can start to speak of the jesus who was gentle to us when he should have knocked us into hell forever but instead he went to the cross for us and he's borne with us so patiently and we can talk about the forgiveness that we've received and how ungrateful it would seem that if we having received such forgiveness didn't show forgiveness to others this cultivating an amazement at what our saviour has done the the forgiveness that he's given to us the gentleness and the patience with which he treats us helps us to live in this world in such a way and then peter would tell us as well that this awe produces godly attitudes and actions this awe we are to cultivate awe because it produces freedom it produces opportunities and it produces godliness in us. Look at what he says in verse 6 of 15, the end of verse 15. Do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who choose to speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. As we live in awe, amazement at who God is, at what he's done, is doing and will do, will not be filled with pride, will not be people who want to uh, win arguments, but will want to win people. Our king would have us win people, no matter who they are or what they've done. One last quote from the Cardis, both of them together here. First of all, Andrew Cardi, he said, we don't have any hate for Robert Black. We just have pity for Robert Black and a fear for him. Then his wife Patricia Cardy interjected and she said, a fear for Robert's end. If he doesn't come to repentance, his end will be an eternity with Satan in hell. They want this man. Remember earlier they had said that uh, Robert Black could receive forgiveness even at this late stage in his life. What an astonishing testimony. Even in that moment, they are not seeking to, even just to win a court case, but to win a person, a human being, who had committed terrible wickedness against them. They are seeking to win him for their saviour. How wonderful a witness and a testimony it is when God's people are shaped by their, their awe and their worship and their delight in their God that we were thinking about this weekend from Psalm 63. And it starts to shape us and we become more gentle and we become more humble and we become filled with a respect for people around us so that we can keep a clear conscience. And that whenever they speak evil of us, they say, people will say to them, no, look, have you actually seen the people you're speaking about? Have you heard what they've done and how they react? You know, sometimes we want to defend our names or defend the names of others. Well, Psalm 37 says that God will vindicate his people. And he will cause our righteousness to shine like the noonday sun. And that seems to be part of what Peter has in view. That we are to live with such winsome, beautiful, gracious gentleness. Yeah, we're not doormats. But we are to live with this gracious, beautiful gentleness. Serving God and living for God. That those who want to speak against us are made to look ridiculous. Because people will say, would you catch yourself on? I know those people. And I know what they've done and how they've lived. And so, how are we to live in a hostile world? Well, the first two things that Peter says are we are to cultivate this love for those around us. And then we are to cultivate an awe of the God who is over us. So that we will live well in the world that he's placed us. Amen. Let's come to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you this evening for that beautiful example of the Cardi family. And we hear it and it sounds utterly astonishing to us. And yet, 
if we were to look over the pages of church history, we would find many stories like that across the centuries. And we would find that your people are marked by this beautiful grace in all sorts of different ways. And so we pray that that would increasingly be our experience, that as we as we fix our gaze on Christ, as we think about the work that he's done for us on the cross, as we think about what he endured for us and how we are called to be like him and how your delight is in us as we grow more and more Christ-like and how you help us by your spirit to live this way and how, having called us to live this way and equipped us to live this way, and it's our privilege to do all of this, you then say that you will bless us and reward us for living the way that you have told us to live and called us to live and equipped us to live. What a generous God you are. And so, Lord God, help us to live in such a way that cultivates love for our fellow uh, human beings and cultivates awe for our God and our Saviour so that we will be asked to give an answer for the hope that is ours because there will be something markedly different about how we live in this world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.